Hello and welcome to The Pulse. In the eyes of many people, Chief Executive Lan Chongying's third and so far least popular policy address seemed more political than practical and indeed began with a swipe at a student publication. We'll be looking at that student publication later in the show. But first, last Sunday, the Hong Kong Army Cadets Association was inaugurated. Its official aim is to make Hong Kong youngsters aware of their responsibilities and obligations as Chinese citizens. The new Hong Kong uniformed group was launched at the People's Liberation Army's naval base on Stonecutters Island. It is the first body in the city training their members in Chinese-style military foot drills. Only pro-Beijing media like Wang Weibo and Taikung Pao newspapers, alongside the state broadcaster, China Central Television were allowed to cover the inauguration ceremony. All other local media were excluded. Chief Executive Lan Zhenying's wife, Regina Tong, was made Commander-in-Chief of the association. The Chief Executive Lan Zhenying, Zhang Xiaoming, Director of the Central Government Liaison Office, and Tang Bang Hong, commander of the People's Liberation Army garrison, are honorary patrons. Some parents fear the uniform group's intention is to promote patriotic propaganda among children. I think in the long run, if more people would learn uh, what is this organization is about and how do they provide the army training and how do they recruit more members, and then that would be a good thing for the organization itself. The Pals contacted a couple of cadet members who went to the ceremony. None of them were willing to be interviewed. However, Nick Zee Lam, a senior officer of the Hong Kong Road Safety Patrol, who went to the ceremony as a guest among members of 13 other uniformed organizations, did agree to speak. The group is not that big because uh, depending on, I, I don't really actually remember the number, I think about 60 or something. I'm not really sure, right? Um, that, that's my, just from my memory, it's about 60. And, uh, but they're very, very good. I think because they went to the summer camp, this is just like an extension of their summer camp. Um, they're um, much more professional and of course it's their open day. So like they yelled out like, and uh, with, with what, what they're, they're saying. So um, that, that was very impressing, like, impressive. The cadets swore an oath to build up Hong Kong and serve the motherland. Many of these cadet members are alumni of an annual military summer camp co-organized by the Concentrated Efforts Resource Center initiated by Tung Jiwa's wife, Betty Tong, the Hong Kong Education Bureau and the PLA garrison in the city. The Hong Kong Army Cadets Association claims to have been planned for a year. However, it was only registered as a non-profit company a day before the ceremony. The association says it is targeting school and higher education students from as young as six years old. It aims to set up branches in every school in the city. Many people worry that it might turn into a replica of Communist Youth League in China. Helping out in the um, in the ceremony, providing the venue, okay, and definitely will be providing further trainings and advice as the organization develops. Clearly, the PRA is definitely doing something which is not supposed to under the terms of the basic law and the garrison law. And that is why I've written to both Xi Jinping as well as the chief executive to remind them the specific terms of the basic law and the garrison law and ask them really, please stop doing that because this is not really what Hong Kong people expect and this is actually acting against the law. Well, with us in the studio is commentator Ching Chung. Some people say, well, what's the problem? You know, it's a youth organization, they give them a uniform, perhaps teach the children some discipline, some patriotism. Is there, is there a problem with that? Yes, of course. Um, we have discipline uh, organization like this. We have also uh, a number of groups uh, with uniform, like the Boy Scout, Girl Guys, St. John's 
uh, ambulance and things like this. But none of these are set up with the aim of um, indoctrinating people. This kind of organizations we've seen lots in, 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 in China in the past. We have the youth organization, we have the, the, the um, uh, young pioneers, for young example. Young pioneers, for example, yes. Mm. They are required to respond to the party's call for some political motives. And we also know that after the 1989 uh, Tiananmen incidents, all the university students has to undergo one year military training in the barracks in the name of uh, strengthening discipline, which in fact was trying to, to, to brainwash the students for one whole year. And I think this is a very typical way of doing things by, by totalitarian regimes. But presumably another uh, um, aspect of this is if it is successful, it won't be successful with all young people. You'll still have scholarism, you'll still have other organisations who are part of the democracy movement. So would this end up intensifying the polarisation of Hong Kong society? Absolutely. I think this is the real danger uh, that we are facing. That's why some commentators are saying that uh, from now on, Hong Kong might be entering into a phase of political civil war. That is exactly what, what, what people has, uh, 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 have in mind. We are, we are very concerned with this development. I wonder whether there is a particular problem with the involvement of the PLA, because some people are saying, well, you know, the garrison law actually doesn't allow them to do this kind of thing. There's a lot of legal problems involved. For example, uh, according to the basic law, the PLA is not supposed to engage in any social activities in, 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 in Hong Kong. They are not supposed to set up any um, social organizations in Hong Kong. And also, the, the, uh, I think the P there is a PLA uh, internal law banning the, uh, the distribution of PLA uniform. To this is everywhere or just in Hong Kong? No, everywhere in, in, in China. In China. Oh, banning right. the distribution of PLA uniform to, to non-PLA people. And obviously, the, according to the, one of the organizers of this uh, group, they are using PLA, a, a special type of PLA uniform. So does it, does it mean that the, the PLA here are distributing uniform to non-qualified people, and these are, there's a lot of uh, legal problems involved. But I suppose the, the, the essential problem I is the political one. Yes. And, I mean, do you think it might mark a, a greater involvement of the PLA in Hong Kong's other affairs? This uh, social organisation has nothing to do with so-called emergency thing. And I think uh, it's very dubious whether the the chief executive has the right to, to, to ask the central government to deploy the PLA for the sake of uh, setting up such an uh, 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 organisation. Now, in, in the policy address, in fact, the chief executive talked about a number of other measures to so-called enhance patriotic education, make school children more aware of the motherland. How, how do you see this fitting into that context? A former uh, senior uh, Chinese official, Chen Zhuo, uh, said that our education system has produced bitter fruits and poisonous beans out of the youngsters. I think this is a very insulting uh, characterization of our youth in Hong Kong. They are going all out to re-indoctrinate our youngsters, the so-called re-enlightenment movement. In the white paper, few people have noticed that the Beijing authorities has secretly deleted one very important provision in the white paper. Uh, compared with the joint declaration and the basic law, Hong Kong is supposed to enjoy high autonomy in executive area, in uh, legislative area, and also in judicial area. Now, this is reiterated in the basic law. And yet, when it comes to the white paper, Hong Kong doesn't enjoy any, ex any rights in executive power anymore. 
And that's why when Chen Zhuo said that the education minister should come under the direct supervision of the, the central government, I immediately uh, sense that this is a follow-up of this uh, uh, white paper. This is the, 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 the white paper put into practice. Ching Chung, thank you very much indeed. And we'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Chief Executive Lan Chung Ying's attack on the University of Hong Kong Students' Union magazine undergrad took many people by surprise and made the magazine and a book that included articles from it more popular than ever. The controversy arose over articles discussing self-determination and self-reliance for Hong Kong. Hong Kong Hong Kong it's a fringe movement, but over the past few years, advocacy for or discussion of an independent Hong Kong has increasingly caught the eye of the public and succeeded in infuriating the pro-Beijing camp. The official line is that Hong Kongers love reunification with the motherland, but the movement has come about as a result of escalating tensions with the mainland over both livelihood matters and broader political issues. This is the background against which an almost one-year-old issue of the Hong Kong University student publication, undergrad and subsequent publications, examined the theme of nationalism. It might not have attracted much attention, but in last week's policy address, Chief Executive Lan Chung Ying singled out the student group for publicizing the idea of self-determination. He said students didn't understand Hong Kong's constitutional relationship with China. Despite the fact that there are so far no concrete signs of genuine separatist activities taking place, former Security Bureau Chief Regina Ip says even talking about it can lead to problems. There's nothing wrong with just discussing or debating or ad even advocating separatist ideas. But these ideas could be dangerous if they are translated into action. Naturally, I don't know at what point they will be translated into action. The book, Hong Kong Nationalism, contains articles from that special edition of undergrad and other sources. Already selling well, it became an even bigger bestseller following the chief executive's comments. However, in its foreword, the authors clearly state that they do not believe independence is the only way to achieve greater self-determination. What drew us to think about this book really come from this clash of values between mainlander and Hong Kong people in terms of uh, their lifestyle, in terms of their cultural identity, and in terms of their political belief. We seek to understand what deeper is going on beneath Hong Kong people identity, and we try to find the solution. Brian Leung, who studies government and law at the University of Hong Kong, feels that democratic development is being suppressed by the Communist Party. Uh Students are not the only ones who worry that Hong Kong's autonomy under the one country, two systems is being eroded. Among them are members of 2047 Hong Kong Monitor, made up of professionals who work in the local financial industry as well as the legal and academic sectors. The basic law and general declaration ha have created a high degree of expectation among the Hong Kong people towards uh, the kind of democracy that we could achieve and enjoy. 
But then all these dreams about democracy, social justice, or a chance of proper social mobility that Hong Kong people enjoy in the past, they were nearly all dead. Dixon Singh thinks it's normal for many people to want to achieve a higher degree of self-determination in the face of tighter controls from Beijing. It showed the uh, uh, rising frustration, especially of the younger generation who were discontented with, with uh, you know, the lack of democracy, the rising uh, social inequity, uh, the very severe, actually ranked as number one by the economies, our corny capitalism. The central government issued a white paper on one country, two system, because they felt they had been challenged. National sovereignty has been challenged. By the way, some people are organizing Occupy Central in total disregard of the basic law. This is not how many of those young people see things. For them, it's a deliberate misinterpretation to claim that ideas of greater self-determination and independence for Hong Kong amount to the same thing. Housing was supposed to be the core issue raised in the policy address. Out of the goodness of his heart, no doubt the chairman of Henderson Land, Li Xiaokei, has said he'd like to help by giving away land currently occupied by the Tai Hang Sai estate. He plans to use it to build 5,000 flats for low-income young people to buy. The estate's current tenants are not so thrilled. The redevelopment of Tai Hang Sai Estate has been discussed by its residents, the private developer Hong Kong Settlers Housing Corporation Limited, and the government for more than a decade. The discussion took on a new intensity last week when Lei Xiaoke, the chairman of Henderson Land, and one of the estate's directors said that he plans to develop the land on which it stands to build home ownership scheme units for young people. That land was granted to the Settlers Corporation at a concessionary price in 1961 to rehouse tenants affected by the clearance of the then Tai Hang Sai resettlement area. Mr. Lee says he wants to help the government solve the housing problem. <laughs> On Thursday morning, dozens of Tai Hang Sai estate residents went to the central government offices and the Henderson Land Development Office at IFC to raise their concerns. They want the government to negotiate with the developer for the residents' best interests and ensure that they will be rehoused both temporarily and permanently. Former Housing Authority Committee member Frederick Fung says that not only does this development proposal not help solve the housing problem, it adds to it. Anthony Jung, the housing secretary, says the government will only take responsibility for resettling the residents if the land is donated to the government directly. After all, Tai Hang Sai Estate is a private property. Everyone 
唔好咁簡單，以為四足做咗好深咯。其實咧誒。Raymond Chow has lived in Tai Hang Sai Estate since the early 1980s. He says it's in poor condition and that makes it dangerous, as seen when his entire kitchen ceiling collapsed while he was cooking. He says he's fixed up the flat at his own expense, but says there are still problems that can't be fixed. <laughs> Just like we are at the polls, but we're out of time right now. However, if you've missed part of the show, go to the RTHK website or our Facebook page, RTHK's The Polls, to catch us. We'll see you at the same time next week. Goodbye.